This is part two of Andrew Jackson's administration lecture, and we're going to start off with the nullification crisis. Now, the nullification crisis, there are really two key concepts that you need to understand. One is federal versus state power is going to be a huge issue, and the second issue, nationalism. So, to start us off, let, let's look at 1828. Now, Jackson is not technically president at this point, but Congress will pass the Tariff of 1828. We've talked about before, tariff supports the North, protects those, those new industries coming out. The South is not going to like the tariff very much because they do get retaliatory tariffs coming out. So, Tariff of 1828 is passed. South Carolina and other states in the South will call it the Tariff of Abominations. Make sure you have that written down, the Tariff of Abominations. And that's really what kicks off this whole crisis. Now, soon after the tariff is passed, um, South Carolina will create a document that will be called the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. John C. Calhoun is one of the writers of this. Again, this is before Jackson becomes president. But Calhoun um, helped to pen this, this document, although his name was not officially on it at the time. And the document, the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, argues that South Carolina had the right to nullify these unfair taxes that were placed on them. So the idea of nullification is coming up. And if you remember correctly, we talked about the idea of nullification being created, or talked about first, with the Virginia and Kentucky Resolution. So there's a connection that can be made between the two. You're seeing this nullification idea come up again. So the tariff goes on, and South Carolina is, is somewhat adamant about not having to pay this tariff. And you'll go through this time period here. And eventually in 1832, there's a second tariff to come about. It's going to heighten the tension in South Carolina between the state and the federal government and who gets to control whether or not these tariffs are, are going to be paid. So when this comes out, South Carolina at this point will vote for nullification of the tariff which really brings the issue uh, up to the surface. And they also threaten to secede if they're going to be forced to pay this tariff. So the idea of secession now is coming out for the first time, or really the second, because we've talked about it with, of course, the Hartford Convention. So this is the second time that, that secession is, is being brought up. Now, at this point, Jackson is president, so he's got to figure out what he's going to do. Is he going to allow the state of South Carolina to nullify the tariff and not pay it, possibly seceding from the Union? Or is he going to step in and exert federal authority over South Carolina? Now, Jackson, being a guy who's typically for the common man, possibly pro-state's rights in some areas, does not, does not actually side with the state here. He sides with the federal government, and he does exert his power. He ends up asserting supremacy of the federal government, um, and he will actually threaten to hang John C. Calhoun, who at the time was not his vice president. He will also advocate to get the force bill passed through Congress, which will allow him, make sure you have the force bill written down, will allow him to use military force to make sure that South Carolina pays this tariff. And, and as you see, we're getting a lot of tension between the states and the federal government here that could potentially end in a very bad way. So who is going to come to save the day? Well, let's see. It's going to be Henry Clay, as we know, the Great Compromiser. Um, I do want to review the cause of this was the tariff of abominations. We have the key concepts here. And then the resolution of this. We'll get what's called the Compromise Tariff, which is going to be created by Henry Clay. Um, and the Compromise Tariff will reduce the tariff over um, I mean, a 10-year period. So that way South Carolina knows that the tariff is going to be going down. But at the same time, they're, they're going to have to pay the tariff as it, as it reduces over those 10 years. Okay, so this, is, this nullification crisis is a very important states' rights issue. Now, it will also be discussed in the webster hain debate, which we'll look at a little bit closer on Monday. But the webster hain debate is between two gentlemen um, in Congress. You have Daniel Webster, who we talked about before with the Webster-Ashburton Treaty and other things. Um, Daniel Webster is going to represent Massachusetts and the, the federal government in his debate. And then you have Senator Robert Hayne of South Carolina, who's going to represent the state's rights issue within the debate. And these two men, you're going to read excerpts of this on Monday, but these two men go through um, the idea of nullification. Is it, is it possible to nullify federal law? Of course, Daniel Webster says absolutely not, that the federal government is supreme, and therefore anybody that attempts to nullify federal law could be considered treasonous. Um, and then you have 
Robert Hayne, who's advocating for the idea of states' rights and the importance of states to be able to say when they feel like something is unconstitutional, such as the Tariff of Bionations Nations here um, and the Tariff of 1832. You know, that's going to be that's going to be really important um, to look at and understand. This is this debate is is iconic of this time period. With although we have sectional issues, we also have this this vying for power between the federal government and the states. Okay, so the next issue we're going to talk about with Andrew Jackson is going to be the Indian Removal. And again, states' issues will come up with the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the federal government. So here you have Andrew Jackson, and I'll mention his goal in a little bit, so we're going to overlook that for right now. But in 1830, you get the Indian Removal Act, which is a plan to remove um, the five nations, and we'll look at which nations those are, Cherokee being one of those, from the east and move them to the west into these new western lands we have gotten. So Manifest Destiny is going to be a part of this to a certain extent. And we're going to move the Native American tribes to an area in Oklahoma. Now, these five nations of Native American groups did not want to move to Oklahoma. Um, they wanted to stay in the land that was promised to them by the federal government through various treaties. Although we know Native American um, and federal government treaties are, are continuously broken as we move further and further west and settlers are wanting that land. So here in Georgia... You have the state of Georgia also wants the land that the Cherokee Nation is on. Um, the Cherokee Nation, what's interesting about them is, is they'll end up going through the procedure that U.S. citizens would use with going through the court system. So you'll have several court cases that you researched yesterday. You have the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, and you have Worcester versus Georgia. Um, we're going to focus a little more on Worcester versus Georgia and the idea that you know, they go through the court system. It gets up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says that you cannot, Georgia, the federal government, cannot forcibly remove the Native American groups, particularly Cherokee Nation here. Now, Jackson will completely ignore this decision. Um, you know, the Supreme Court's responsibility is to interpret the Constitution. Executive Office is, is responsible for enforcing. So the Indian removal will go through, and you will get and this is a map of the Indian removal. So you see the Seminole, Cherokee Creek, Chickasaw, and the Choctaw tribes will all be removed. Those are the five tribes we're talking about here. And they will be removed. The Trail of Tears is, is the predominant path that the Cherokee will take. And, of course, you know from your reading the um, atrocities that will happen on this, that, that the Native Americans are not treated necessarily well by the troops that are, are leading them. You'll have a large um, death toll on this on this track, and they will be removed and forced to live in the in this area um, in the West. And that's not, not what they wanted. It's not that they had any choice in the matter, um, even though the Supreme Court said they could not forcibly be removed. So you're going to see there is possibly um, or definitely an expansion of the executive power over the judicial branch here. Okay, let's move on to Jackson's use of the veto. So Jackson is going to be the first president to use the pocket veto, and that's where it hits his desk, but he doesn't sign um, sign the legislation. So one piece of, of a veto that you definitely need to know about is also in 1830, you have the Maysville Road veto. Now, the Maysville Road was a, a project in Kentucky, and this was, of course, was the state of his political rival, Henry Clay, who had pushed the Maysville Road um, act through Congress or help to help to get it there. And the idea here is the Maysville Road would be an internal improvement to help help western areas, particularly Kentucky predominantly here. And that Jackson will veto this internal improvement um, because, and his argument is this, it only benefited benefited one state and therefore federal money shouldn't be used for the internal improvement. If it was across state lines that would be different but because it was within one state he did not feel like the money should go to that one state. Okay so that's just one example of his veto. I'll also mention part of it was probably also that Henry Clay here was was one of the the advocates for the bill and it would have helped his state. Um, I think that's important to look at on to one of the biggest issues in Jackson's administration, and that is the issue of the National Bank. Okay, now keep in mind, Henry Clay is the person who created or helped get pushed through the charter, or second charter of the second National Bank. So it's in existence there in this time period. 
Um, Nicholas Biddle is going to be president of the bank in um, 1823. And you have President Andrew Jackson here, who is not going to be a proponent of the National Bank. Now, Jackson's idea is that the bank is unconstitutional. He'll speak on that behalf. He believes that it's unconstitutional. It shouldn't be there. It's not for, for the, the best interest of all Americans. Um, now, keep in mind, the McCullough versus Maryland case under John Marshall's court declared that it was constitutional. Okay? So we're kind of going against that case. One thing I do want to mention about Nicholas Biddle is that he will start a process of holding banknotes. There's two types of currency. There's banknotes, and if they're issued um, correctly and with restraint, you know, the economy keeps going well. But these are like I use pretty much from a bank. <clears throat> if not, which was what was happening, they were being issued recklessly to people who might not be able to pay off that debt, and that could be a problem. So he starts collecting these banknotes in hopes that specie currency or hard specie, hard currency being gold and silver, would predominantly be what would be used in the economy to pay for things, um, including land sales, other, other types of things. And he's trying to stabilize the economy essentially here. Um, there's no uniform currency at the time. We don't have greenbacks. That won't be until a little bit later where you get the idea of paper money issued from the federal government. Point, the election of 1832 is looming. And the National Republicans decide that a good issue to bring up in 1832 would be the National Bank. It's five years away from where it needs to be rechartered, and the National Republicans are going to push um, the rechartering five years early. So at this point, Jackson's in office as president. The 1832 election is going on. And they know Jackson is, is probably going to veto it. And they ha their hopes is, is that they will override his veto um, or be able to swing it through, and then it will become a big national issue. It will make Jackson look bad, and then they have years to kind of get it passed again if they needed to. So what ends up happening here, Jackson, of course, will, will veto the rechartering of the National Bank. Um, and at this point, you know, he makes a speech talking about how it's unconstitutional. He declares that the bank was a monopoly run by the rich, which is, is somewhat partially true there. Um, not the unconstitutional, but that was run by the rich. And he also said the bank was, was run by foreign investors. Um, you know, he's trying to capitalize on those anti-immigrant feelings of the time period. And that's not necessarily true at this point. Um, he didn't really talk about reforming the bank. His focus was to end the bank. So at this point with his veto, um, he, he is going to attempt to veto it. But here's the problem. The bank has five more years to be in existence, even though the rechartering doesn't, doesn't work. It's not successful. So he has five years. He wants to destroy the bank. He doesn't just want it to, you know, work for five years and then be gone. He wants it to be gone now. So at this point, what he decides to do is he orders um, one secretary at the time, Secretary Louis McLean, to withdraw all the money from, from the U.S. bank, the National Bank. And that way, if the bank doesn't have money, it won't run, it won't be successful, he'll kill it. And McLean says, no, Jackson, we can't do that because that could hurt our economy. It wouldn't be a good idea. So he ends up firing McLean and he promotes William Dwayne to Secretary of Treasury, does the same thing. Dwayne also refuses. He will not withdraw the money. He fires him. And at this point, Attorney General Roger Taney, um, who we'll talk about again later, and Roger Taney will kind of respond in an unexpected manner. He says, well, how about we don't withdraw all the money, but instead we just don't make new deposits. If we're not adding to the money, then that wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing. We're not adding to the funds housed in, in, in the National Bank. We're not increasing it. And at the same time, we'll start paying all of our debts off um, with the money inside the National Bank. So they start to drain the funds of the National Bank through paying all of these debts off. Um, and any new deposits, instead of placing in the National Bank, will now be placed in state banks, which will be called pet banks, P-E-T, pet banks, state or local banks. These are the favorite banks um, that were, were state banks that are less secure than the National Bank. Some people will refer to them as wildcat banks because you just don't know if they're going to be stable or unstable. Um, and the reckless use of loans that Nicholas Biddle was trying to stop with the with the holding of banknotes is going to continue. So you're going to you're going to get some increased problems there. We'll wrap up Jackson's administration with a species circular um, tomorrow. So see you then.